Bueno, vamos a ver a Leonard Susskind hablando de un tema espectacular que es si el universo está bien tuneado, ¿no? Como que está hecho para la vida y para la mente, ¿no? Como un universo antrópico. Vamos a escuchar, por lo menos veamos una parte, un buen disparador. Leonard, what is it about the fine tuning of this universe that causes such energy, such controversy among scientists, philosophers, theologians, everyone today is talking about fine tuning. Why? Well, it seems, and we don't completely understand why, that the laws of physics, laws of cosmology, laws of how the universe evolved seem to be very special. Of course, they're special. Everybody would expect them to be special, but they're special in a way that's unexpected. They seem to be special in the way that is just very, very conducive to our own existence. The laws of physics could have been very different. Um, you could imagine a world that didn't have electrons in it. There's nothing wrong with that in the basic uh, theory of uh, the mathematical theory of physics. You could just throw away the electron. What would happen if you threw away the electron? No chemistry. No atoms, no chemistry, no biology, no... Esto eh, tiene un fundamento, ¿no? Que es, en física en general, es como que no está bueno que las cosas estén tuneadas, digamos. La idea es que si hay un número que da tanto, buscar las teorías que expliquen eso, ¿no? Entonces... Si vos tenés un montón de parámetros físicos que dan algo, la idea es buscar una teoría más fundamental que te explique por qué da eso. Está claro que gran parte de esos parámetros de alguna forma inciden en que exista el universo en el que estamos, la galaxia, el sol, la tierra y nosotros, etc. Y está yendo hacia eso. People to ask the question. We just wouldn't be here to ask the question. You could change the rules in other ways. You could make gravity stronger. Gravity is very, very weak. You know, normal people think gravity is very strong. When I wake up in the morning, especially the older I get, the harder it is to get out of bed. Yeah. So I think, oh boy, wouldn't it be nice if there wasn't much gravity? Well, in fact, gravity really is very, very weak. If you were to compare in an atom, the gravitational force between the electrons and protons compared to the electrical force, the gravitational force is completely negligible. Why is eso es todo un tema, ¿no? Que la gravedad es súper débil, pues uno tiene la fuerza electromagnética, ¿no? La interacción débil y fuerte, pero la, la gravitatoria es muchísimo más débil. Es gravity so much weaker than the other forces. Well, we don't really know, but here's what we do know. If it were just even a little bit stronger, stars would burn out too quickly. They wouldn't live long enough for life to evolve. Instead of stars, instead of galaxies, we'd have black holes. We can't live in a black hole. I mean, you know, science fiction, maybe you can live in a black hole, but we can't really. Uh, pro most likely, the universe would expand and contract too rapidly. And Entonces, lo que está diciendo es, bajo las características, ¿no? los parámetros que tenemos, cambias un parámetro, no todo lo demás lo dejamos igual, pero el parámetro de la fuerza gravitatoria, ¿no? que sea un poco más fuerte, listo, hay un montón de otras cosas, otros procesos que no se pueden dar, que son fundamentales para que exista la vida como nosotros, ¿no? And so everything seems to be almost on a knife edge, that if you were to change the rules of physics, the laws of physics, even a little bit, every, the world as we know it wouldn't exist. How, how many of these constants or laws of physics would fit into this category of fine tuning, where it has to be on a knife edge or close to that? There's debate about that. There's debate about just how, how sharp the knife edge is. For, uh, now, almost everything, if you changed it very much, uh, the electric charge of the electron, uh, the mass of this or that particle, various constants of nature, how strong gravity is, if you changed it by a few percent, 10%, some of them 20%, some of them 30%, uh, you would really be in trouble. Mm. The universe wouldn't look as it It, as it does. Are we dealing with a couple of dozen? Are we dealing yeah, with... we're dealing with a couple of dozen. Yeah. Eh, mencionó algunas que es, eh, algunos de los parámetros que son fundamentales. Ustedes saben que el modelo estándar de partículas tiene un montón de parámetros libres que los tenés que ir a poner con experimentos. La teoría no te lo predice. Las masas de las partículas es, son, son esos parámetros. Hay un montón más. Ahí mencionó la carga. 
pero digamos la, la, la interacción, la, 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 qué tan fuerte es cada interacción, es otro parámetro que hay que meter también. Yeah. We're dealing order with a couple of dozen order of magnitude, okay. a couple of dozen constants. All right, let, let's talk about one of them though that has some particular uh, uh, strangeness to it, the so-called cosmological yeah. constant. That's that's right. That's the one which is really on the knife edge. Okay, it is on such a narrow knife edge that it's almost inconceivable if you were to change it just the tiniest, tiniest bit, we couldn't be here. This cosmological constant is a kind of, it's almost a kind of anti-gravity. It's a kind of repulsive force that's implicit in Einstein's equations for general relativity. Vamos a decir algo de eso. La constante como lógica es un parámetro que se le mete a las ecuaciones de Einstein. Las ecuaciones de Einstein no prohíben este, este parámetro, por lo tanto llamarlo antigravedad es como... Es decir, que como que va en contra de la gravedad y en realidad es como que es gravedad, por más que va en contra, en el sentido de que no es atractivo, ¿no? Entonces, es lo que es una explicación para la, la energía oscura. La energía oscura que lo que hace es expandir el universo eh, aceleradamente. Bueno, este parámetro estaría muy, muy, muy ajustado. Y eso es un problema, ¿no? Cuando uno tiene un parámetro que da justo eh, bien, voy a ver si ahora lo, lo dice, si no lo digo yo, este, es todo un tema. It could be there. Physicists had every reason, theoretical reason, not experimental reason, theoretical reason to think that the world should have this kind of anti-gravity. Anti-gravity would cause everything to separate at an enormous rate, repulsion. Uh, the actual magnitude of it is incredibly small. It is so tiny that the anti-gravity force is only felt on the largest possible scales in the universe. It takes an enormously large space and volume and time for the cosmological constant to create any real repulsion. This is not because the mathematics tells us that. This is just because for some unknown reason, this constant, whatever made the universe, I hate to say whoever you made the universe, <laughs> Uh, physicists have a, a habit of talking in that language, whoever made the universe. They don't... Eso es como que los parámetros los puso Dios, ¿no? Entonces, el quien lo haya hecho puso los parámetros así. I don't really mean it. But whoever made the universe made it with an incredibly small, tiny cosmological constant. It is so small that it is point zero, 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 zero. We can sit here for a while, <laughs> yeah. 123 of them. And then a one. And then a one. <laughs> I think it's actually a two. <laughs> But uh, it is incredibly small, and nobody really knows why. The one thing that we do know is that if it were very much stronger, it would have blasted apart the galaxies. It would have prevented stars from forming. So you have to understand, galaxies and stars and planets formed because gravity pulled them together in the very early universe. This counteracting anti-gravity could have prevented that, could have prevented the formation of stars, planets, and so forth. So if it were just a little bit bigger, just a little bit bigger than this 0 .0000000, it would have prevented our existence. Physicists have never understood why it's so small. And okay, that Let's... is the sharpest part of this knife edge. Okay, we... Vamos a hacer un comentario sobre eso. Entonces, las, vos lo que haces es observás que hay una aceleración de, de la expansión del universo, ¿no? Eh, la teoría de relatividad general ya te predice, hay universos en los cuales se puede expandir, pero si vos te crees aceleradamente puedes poner este parámetro, la constante cosmológica, la llamada lambda, y es, eso es permitido y es una gravedad repulsiva, y listo, y lo explicas así, ¿no? Después es, ¿qué, ¿qué interpretación le das a eso, no? El número es muy, muy chiquito, y, bueno, ¿qué representa eso, no? We have fine tuning. We've got to deal with it now. There are a number of ways that we can explain that. I mean, it cries out for explanation. Yes. We cannot say, oh, yes, fine, and let's yeah. go on. We have to explain it one way or another. Basically, there are three explanations. Okay. 
Number one. Okay. God. <laughs> number two. <laughs> <laughs> that that, we, that <laughs> one I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Accident. Okay. All right, that, the, the, that's the strange being, credulity just right. by uh, on its face credulity. value. Right. So it's right. an accident just that way, and it happens to work out perfectly. Right. 123 decimal places, zero, not likely to be an accident. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a fourth way. A oh, third. I, I didn't you want to, let, me, let me put the fourth way in okay. for, uh, before okay. I, put, okay. I get to the okay. third. Yeah. The fourth way is, who knows, maybe someday somebody will figure it out. Oh, sure. There is one ultimate right. solution. All of right. these constants of right. major can be devolved. Maybe down to somebody a, will figure to a it fundamental out in the equation that some fundamental express equation. all of these right. as as derived. From but that would that would partly fall into the category of accident. You take some fundamental equation mm -hmm. and you solve it. It would take an incredible accident for it to have a solution which was all that small. The last way, which physicists don't like. They don't like it because it runs against their ambitions. The ambition was to explain every constant, every number, to understand everything about the universe. The other way goes as follows. The universe is enormously big. We know that, incidentally. And when I say enormously big, I don't mean uh, like we used to think 10 billion light years. I mean 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10th. We have no idea how big it is. Enormously big. We suspect that it is very much bigger than the region we can see. We also have reason to believe. Acuérdense que el universo es, eh, que conocemos es el universo visible, que es toda la luz que te llega. Pero uno supone que por fuera de lo que vos ves hay más universo. Cuanto más no lo sabes. Puedes especular, hacer algún argumento estadístico, pero no sabes. If that it's diverse. That, um, that in different places it has different properties. There's good theoretical reason to believe that in some places maybe there is no electron. In other places, gravity is stronger. And in some places, this cosmological constant may be, may be much bigger. The picture is that there's some very small fraction of the universe where the conditions just happen to be right for the existence of life. And it's not a surprise. That's where life is. It's more or less like asking, why do we by accident happen to live on a planet which happens to be at just the right temperature for liquid water to exist? That's a narrow range. Not as narrow, it's not as much of a knife edge as the cosmological constant. Why is that? Well, the answer is very simple. Es muy distinto, ¿no? Eh, como lo dice, eh, digamos justo vivir en un planeta que tiene agua y tiene la temperatura para que haya agua líquida, que poner un parámetro de, del universo que afecta a todo el universo, ¿no? On planets where there can't be water, there can't be life. So it's true, a very small fraction of the planets in the universe are at the right temperature for water to exist. Where do we live? We live in the only place we can live, where water exists. Same kind of picture, universe very big, very diverse, many different environments, a huge, huge slew of different possibilities. And among these possibilities, in a few small pockets of the universe, conditions are right for life, and that's where life exists. With planets, we know that there are large numbers of planets where yes. a small number would be in the habitable zone where we have liquid water and the vast majority are not. We have that. With universes, we are relying upon theoretical ideas to That's say right. there are different bubble universes, pocket universes, yes. uh, uh, inflation theory, chaotic internal inflation creating. Está mencionando muchas teorías. Hay que decir que eso es muy especulativo. Digamos, no se sabe si hay como burbujas de constantes del universo, ¿no? De hecho, no, no, no sé hasta qué punto hay evidencia de que ciertas constantes cambien en el espacio. Es como que yo te diga que la luz acá es 300.000 y en otro lado es 150. Y así con todas las constantes. No, no hay, hasta donde yo sé, evidencia de eso. Serían como otros universos burbuja, ¿no? Different situation, each one of which has different laws. So we need to have that step. That's right. We need not only to have a vast number of possibilities. Possibilities are like blueprints. They're blueprints for different kinds of universes. I like to think of the possibilities as the possibilities analogous to the possibilities of life. DNA is the blueprint for life. 
DNA has a vast number of ways of being rearranged, and so there's a vast number of possibilities for life, but that in itself doesn't say that there are a vast number of living creatures around. It took something to make those blueprints into actual houses right. or whatever it happens to be. So part of the story is cosmological, that the expansion of the universe, the what you called inflation of the universe, the very, very rapid expansion that took place at very, very early times, created a lot of quantum fluctuation. And that quantum fluctuation created patches of space with different properties. Those patches are sometimes called pocket universes, they're sometimes called bubble universes. Insisto que está bien, la, la inflación no tiene que ver con una aceleración también que tuvo el universo, el, el, la aceleración de expansión muy al principio del universo. Eh, pero eh, esto de que haya burbujas y todo eso no está comprobado, ¿no? But we live in one of them. That's the picture. Uh, that's the picture. There's mathematics that goes with it. And... For those of us who believe in this particular picture of a tremendously diverse, some people call it. Ahí usó la palabra creer, ¿no? Porque es como que él va por esa teoría, pero no, no está comprobado. Call it a multiverse. Uh, multiverse. Like megaverse. I like megaverse. <laughs> And as I, as I said in my book, the reason I like megaverse has nothing to do with any ideology. Multiverse just reminds me of multiplex cinemas, which I don't like. <laughs> I like small movies. <laughs> You've so, actually coined this term uh, landscape I did. to describe. I did, I did, but, the, but there was a background. And the background comes from biology. The landscape of biological, biological designs. And it means all the possible ways you could put DNA together. It's a tremendously large number of possibilities describing life. Vamos a terminar acá para que no quede muy largo, pero lo que está describiendo ahí básicamente es... Eh, que cuando vos tenés un, multi, eh, un multiverso o megaverso, vale todo. Y entonces decís, bueno, acá vale esto, pero en realidad en otros lados vale otra cosa y así te sacas el problema. Pero es una forma sencilla de solucionar el problema, pero la verdad es que sí ahí, no, no tiene comprobación. Pero bueno, dejen en los comentarios si tienen alguna observación de esto. Y nada, eso es lo más importante.